From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. More than 40% of Americans set New Year's resolutions, but one in three will ditch them by the end of January, and less than 10% will reach their goals. Today, Pastor Clay is picking up where he left off last week and showing us how the Apostle Peter challenges us in some very practical ways to answer the calling as a follower of Jesus. Thanks for joining us. Now here's Pastor Clay. Oh, I heard nobody won the Powerball last night. With a B, one billion dollars. Can you, can you imagine a billion dollars? <laughs> let's, let's face it, apparently a lot of people can't imagine it because as, as uh, Powerball, as lottery things go up, uh, the escalation of ticket sales jumps uh, through the roof. Uh, it just goes up as, as people continue to buy more and more tickets and it continues to go up higher and, and higher and higher. I read last night, that the average uh, lottery uh, player uh, spends $700 a year on tickets. Okay, compared to a billion dollars, maybe $700 is not that much, but it's a pretty good chunk of change to take a chance on something that, from my understanding, you have better odds of being struck by lightning twice than, (laughs) yes, from a clear blue sky. (laughs) Uh, than, than of winning uh, the lottery. But still, it, it, it drives people, right? Because the odds are so minuscule, but somebody does win, right? Sooner or later, somebody does win. And um, I don't know about, about you. Y'all are probably much more spiritual than I am. But, but when I hear of something like that, when, when I hear of somebody you know, winning a billion dollars you know it's almost like it's like a knee-jerk reflex reaction automatically in my mind I think man what would I do with a billion dollars like I said y'all are much more spiritual than I am (laughs) Uh, this is the part where I'm going to sound like the preacher but uh, you know it won't make you happy You'd like to try, right? But, but you know that in the end, ultimately, all the toys and trinkets, all the actions and adventures and travel and all that stuff, uh, you know, I, hey, if you're in a place in your life and you're blessed to be able to do that, God bless you. That's, that's wonderful. But, but you know that ultimately, if the Bible is true, that that's not what will ever bring lasting satisfaction, contentment, and peace to your life. It, it, it just won't. Not, not really. Did you know that um, Dave Ramsey, the financial advisor Dave Ramsey, says that the divorce rate is four times higher than the national average uh, for people that have won the lottery? Four times higher. Somebody's at my house. <laughs> Never mind, you don't know what that. Okay, uh, four times higher than the uh, national average. 65% of people that win the lottery, a lottery, 65% of them are bankrupt within 15 years. Now, some of you may not believe those statistics. Some of you would like to think that that you would be the exception and and, and maybe you would, I don't know. I'm just telling you that that as a general rule, uh, most people spend their lives trying to find their life. One of the reasons why I think uh, bankruptcy and the divorce rate is so so much higher among lottery winners, and and by the way, you'd find that statistic uh, elevated also among just just generally the wealthy, whether whether they've made you know, hundreds of millions of dollars themselves, where they inherited or what, you find those statistics are highly elevated in all of those lives. I, I have this theory that one of the reasons is because most of us, you know, average normal people that, you know, make a living and try and, you know, exist on that living and all that stuff, 
that, it, that a person without a relationship with Christ, especially, that, that they, try and, they spend their lives trying to find it. You know what I'm saying? That if I just get that newer, updated car, or if I just um, got, you know, 2,200 square feet instead of 1,600 square feet. Or if, and so we're, so we're pursuing this thing. We're always pursuing this, this thing. But think about it. A person that, that is suddenly plunged into wealth, that can suddenly have anything they want, guess what they discover? It, it's, not, it's not what they thought it would be. It doesn't satisfy them. I remember, and I've looked for this quote, and I can't find this quote, but I remember this quote years ago. I read this quote from Harrison Ford uh, right after he became a, like a superstar in, uh, in, in Star Wars, you know, kind of elevated him, and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark really uh, launched him into, into superstardom. I mean, if you don't know it, Harrison Ford was a, was a day laborer before, he, uh, before Lucas uh, tagged him for... Uh, first American graffiti, but that's another story. Anyway, uh, he, was, he was just a carpenter. He was a, he was a carpenter uh, working around in, in California. And, uh, and so he was asked one time, what is it like to go from basically just paycheck to paycheck trying to get by to being able to, to have anything you want, buy anything you want, do anything you want, go anywhere you want? And I, I was really struck by his, this, what he said. Harrison Ford said, it seems that the more I have, the less content I am. I'm telling you, that's true. I read that in quote after quote after quote of those lottery winners last night that, all, that went bankrupt or divorced or whatever. Time after time after time, I kept hearing that. I was better off before I had it. I was better off when I didn't have it. I, it's that whole idea. Most people spend their lives trying to find their life. And Peter tells us exactly where to find life. Open your Bibles, if you have a copy with you this morning, to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, the text is going to be up on the screen also, uh, but maybe you've got an electronic copy, a hard copy, uh, something like that. Open to 1 Peter chapter 4. The back of your program also has a sermon outline. Uh, if you like to take notes, feel free to do so. Part of that is filled in because we're kind of continuing uh, a passage where we started last week. and I'm going to talk briefly about that and then move on uh, to the other two really important areas uh, about uh, life and, and where we find this contentment and happiness and peace and joy. And, and, right? That's, isn't that really ultimately what we're looking for? I really think. Last week, uh, we started with this idea. We are called to a life of death. And I, I, I hope that didn't sound too harsh. Uh, you know, I, I said my wish for you in 2016 was death. And uh, I, all week I felt kind of bad about that. Um, but, but, but I think if you were here, you kind of know where we're going with that, that, that there's this call to, to die to ourself. And, that's, and it's in that, that decision to, to, to die to myself that I actually find life for myself. So uh, we're called to a life of death. Let me read verses 1 through 7. I read them last week. Uh, let me read them again uh, this morning. Therefore... Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. In other words, he said, once you make up your mind, this decision that, that I, I'm, I'm dead to me, then you're able to die to these, these fleshly desires. I'm getting ahead of myself. But he says, so as, verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time, in the flesh. Now, in other words, he's not talking about that you're going to, he wants you to physically kill yourself. He wants you to commit suicide because he says, as you live on the rest of your life, if you consider yourself dead, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you have carried out the desires of the Gentile, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking, parties, and abominable idolatries. I said this last week, I'll say it again. Peter's not, his intention is not to list an exhaustive uh, list of, of, of sins. He's, he's just saying, listen, before Christ, it was just all about you. It was all about the flesh. and It may have been drunkenness. It may have been carousing. It may have been uh, blandering, it, may, it could be a lot of different things, but in, in, the, yes, in, in the end, it's just, it's just about you. He said, you've had enough time. Whatever part of time you spend in your life doing that, that's enough time. Verse 4, in all this, they are surprised you do not run with them. Who's they? Who's they? 
the, yeah, your, your old party buddies? Any of y'all have any of the old party buddies? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People that are not following Christ. So if, 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 you, if you make this life decision, life change, well then they, they don't, what? what, what, what's going on with you? What's happened? What's wrong with you? That's what you usually get, right? But what, what's wrong with you? In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. He, it's just a, that's just New American Standard way of saying living for yourself, partying, carrying on, whatever. And they malign you. They make fun of you. They talk about you. They gossip about you. They, verse 5, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We can never get far from that idea, ladies and gentlemen. For the gospel has, for this purpose, been preached even to those who are dead. That though they are judged in the flesh as men, they're, they're dead in the spirit, they don't know Christ as Savior. Though they're judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. That's why, Peter, that's why the gospel is preached. So that lives can be changed. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. It's communing with God. So we're called to a life of death. It's, it's laying down our lives. Uh, and it, while we may physically still be alive, we are considering ourselves as dead. And I, I mentioned last week that, that, I don't know, maybe it's not true for you. Again, you're much more spiritual than I am. But I find that extremely difficult at times. To, to lay aside my flesh and operate in the spirit. Do you know what I'm saying? To let the spirit of God have control of me rather than clay have control of me. Does that make sense? And so we walk through, it's, it's on your outline, but just, just to show it to you. We walk through some steps of how do, I, how do I die to myself? How do I get up every morning and say, all right, it's not me. I'm not, you know, this not this flesh, but I operate in the spirit. And so there was, a, there was a list of things. And I think, like I said, I think that's filled in on your, on your outline on the back. But, but I, I, I listed these ideas of looking back at Jesus. We look back at him as a provider in his picture. He pictured this is how we live life. This is how we walk away from sin. This is how we overcome temptation and all that kind of stuff. We look past others. When, when Peter says that they'll make fun of you, they'll malign you, they won't, they, they won't like you, they won't understand why you're doing it. You have to look past that. You have to look past all of that. And you have to look past their condition, understanding that, that they act that way because they're lost. And lost people act the way they do because they are lost. You have to look past that condition and, and care about the person. You remember talking about that if you were here? We've got to care about where people spend their eternal destiny. That's a long time to use that word time. And then we have to look ahead to the end. Peter says the end, it, it, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's, at some point, it's coming for us. And so we look ahead to what will be and we look ahead to what will not be. All those things that, uh, that won't matter anymore, all that kind of stuff. We go back and listen to that message. We talked about all those things. But it, that's, that's a process. And, and that may not be the, uh, you know, a tell-all. It may not be everything. There may be some other things, or there may be other ways to get there. But it, this, is a, this is a formula for how you can, can wake, wake up every day and begin to say, all right, whatever happens today, it's not about me. Listen, I... I a lot of you have heard, or some of you at least have heard this story. You're familiar with, with Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a missionary who, along with four other uh, young men, uh, Nate Saint and Pete Fleming and Roger McCulley, or uh, Ed McCulley and Roger Yowderain, uh, those five young men were killed in 1956. They were savagely murdered by uh, the Alka Indians in Central America when they attempted to take the gospel to them. If you're familiar with the story, you know that every mission agency warned them, told them, no, they're savages, though you don't go near them, don't do it. And they felt this burden that, well, how are they ever going to hear the gospel? If somebody doesn't go, how are they ever going to hear the gospel? If somebody doesn't take a risk, and can I tell you, just in life, people, as a general rule, don't like to take risks. It's true in their spiritual life. People don't, don't, don't grow and don't move forward because they don't want to take risks. They're just kind of comfortable where they are. And, and, and Elliot, you know, if, if, if we don't take a risk, how is everything going to happen? One of my favorite uh, Jim Elliot quote. By the way, just let me, uh, if you've never read it, Through Gates of Splendor, a fantastic book. It's an account 
of, uh, of what went on, written by Jim Elliott's widow, Elizabeth Elliott. Highly recommend that book, Through Gates of Splendor. You might want to consider reading that. Um, but one of my favorite Jim Elliott quotes is something he wrote in his prayer journal not very long uh, before uh, he died. And this is what he said. Let's look at this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That is profound. There, there are not a lot of things in this world that I say are profound. That, ladies and gentlemen, is profound. When you come to this understanding that anything in this life that you give up, what is that? If you gain what you cannot lose. This is the idea, and then we'll move on this morning. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, that, that, and this is it. He says, this, this is how you have to think of this. This is uh, this, this call to a life of death. I have been crucified with Christ. And so it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul was still alive after he wrote those words, but, but he was making this intellectual decision to say, I am dead. By the way, can I let you in on a little secret about, you know, people hurt your feelings. We're going to talk some about that this morning. People hurting your feelings or people doing things or, or whatever else. Can I just tell you this? It, it's hard to hurt a dead man's feelings. You know what I'm saying? So if I can just, and I know, I know, I know it's hard. Woo. But, but if I can, can operate in that, in that place where I said, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm throwing that out there. So it starts with this idea of this, this life called to this life of death. And by the way, it's not a uh, one-time decision. Well, you know, at youth camp, I, I, I committed my life to Christ. And, and so, listen, I, again, you're more, far more spiritual than I am, but I have to get up every day and try to consciously say that. Think about that. Say it out loud. Say, God, today, may I act as a dead man toward myself. That it's not about me. And we get it right some, we don't get it right some. And, you know, all those kind of things. But it starts with that idea, okay? All right, the second idea then this morning, and you can fill in some, some notes if you like to do this, but the second idea, we're called to a life of death, but we're also called to a life of love. Can I get you all to say that with me out loud? We are called to a life of love. Why don't you, why don't you just uh, turn to somebody beside you, if somebody sitting beside you, say, say that, we're called to a life of love. I just like to have that kind of power over you. I just, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to try and get you to say something else later, too, if I think of it. Listen, listen, let, let me read Verse 8 and 9, watch this. Above all, above, above everything else, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Uh, the Bible commentator Warren Wiersbe says that this uh, word in the New American Standard is translated fervent. Wiersbe says that it, it pictures a, an athlete straining, straining for the, the, the goal line, the, the end line, the tape. It, it can be translated as, as uh, constant or continual or or, uh, or passionate. In other words, it is, more, it is intended to be more than just a nice, smiley, superficially, I don't even know if that's a word, super surfacy uh, engagement or relationship with each other. Which, by the way, in this context, he, he's... There's application for marriage, but when he's talking about loving one another, uh, you do understand who he's talking to, right? He's talking to the body. This call 
to love one another. And he said, it's like, it's, it's fervent in, in this love. It's, it's like you're straining to get there. You want it so badly. That you are passionate, you are fervent about this love for one another. It carries that idea. So it's more than surfacy, it's more than superficial. It is much deeper than that. Listen to me. This is really, really, really important for a biblical understanding of love. Love is more than an emotional feeling. And listen, I say that to you, you have to, I say it for a couple of reasons, I have to say it to you, number one, because you have to understand that if you're going to have success in any of your relationships, if you are married, if you're going to get married someday, if you hope to get married someday, if you uh, work with people, if, you, if you're going to be part of a local body of believers, what, what your family, whatever the case may be, to have success in those relationships, you have to understand this. You have to understand this. So I point that out, number one, for that reason, but number two, because... According to the world, and when I say the world, I just mean everything outside the body of Christ. There are people just operating not within the parameters of this book. For the world, an emotional feeling is the only thing that love is. It's the only thing that love is. Which, by the way, explains why almost one out of every two marriages in this country end up in divorce. Because... When the person that you are connected to or, or married to, whatever the case, when, when this person does something to, to hurt your feelings or to uh, diminish your feelings or to perhaps even in, in that moment make you feel like you don't even have those feelings at all. When that person does something like that, well then by the world standard that marriage is over because the, why? The feeling is gone. And trust me on this, if you have not experienced this for yourself, trust me on this, the other person will do something to hurt your feelings. They will do something to, that, that, will, that will hurt you. That They will. Because listen, this is, just, this, 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 this is how it is. We're human. And we can do some stupid human stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? We can say the wrong thing. We can do the wrong thing. We can get hurt. We can get angry. We can feel resentful. We can be bitter. We can, we can, we can lash out. We can do all of these things. Love is more than an emotional feeling. I didn't say it that, that, that emotions are no, are no part of it. But I'm saying love is more than an emotional feeling. Love is more than an emotional feeling. Love, ladies and gentlemen, is a volitional choice of my will I choose to love this person of my will based not just on my emotional feelings because I think we firmly establish that can come and that can go it can sometimes be strong it can sometimes wane it's more than an emotional feeling it is a volitional choice of my will Will. Now that is, is vitally important that we love each other in this way. It is the believer to believer relationship that, that Peter is talking about here. And it is vitally important that we have love for each other in that way. Not only because, as the Bible teaches, not only because it is a witness to the world, which it is, the love that we can have for each other should blow people away. It really should. Wow, you, they did what for you? Y'all are doing what together? You... Not only is it a witness to a world to the world, but it is also vitally important because, and I'm saying, bringing it up again, I'll say it again, because we are not perfect and we do not get it right all the time. Wow, how I wish we did. How I wish that coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ just, just was a, like an easy pass straight to perfection, Bill. But it's not. It's not. We are imperfect people. And while the Spirit of God may dwell within us after we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, there is still this natural man, this natural person that wants to 
to get in this tug of war and wants to win and wants clay to act like clay. And it ain't pretty. So we make this volitional choice to love. And when we don't make this volitional choice to love, then we're not able to overlook the, the mistakes, the imperfections of the people, which is what Peter is talking about here. That love covers over the, the, the actions that, that we, the way we treat each other. That it's because, now listen, only God has the ability to forgive sins. But you and I can choose, can make a volitional choice of our own free will to choose to love. And if we do that, then, then it, co- it covers, oh, I'm able to overlook. Cindy's able to overlook the, what I might do to her, or how I might mistreat her, or the mistakes I might make. You're able to overlook uh, if, I, if I neglect you or, or don't smile at your joke or, or whatever the case, you know, whatever it would be that would cause us to say, well, we're able to overlook those things. Love allows us to do that. This kind of love that God gives to us. John 13, 34 says this, a new commandment I give to you that you, say that with me, love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. Now it's, it's oh, 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 Jesus, really? Okay, it, it was enough just to tell us to love one another, but then you got to use yourself as our, as our comparison, as our model? We, you mean I got to love Michael Martin, the way you love me, Jesus? <laughs> he's easy to love. He's, just a, he's a lovable guy. But you know, uh, a new command I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. Well, let's see. How did he love us? Unconditionally. Irrevocably eternally yeah but you 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 just you don't know how they treat me you don't know how angry she makes me you don't know what they did you don't know how they forgot that you don't know this i don't unless you call me for a counseling session I'm pretty sure he does. And that's what he says. He says, you love exactly the way. So, so not only is it a witness to the world, when you and I can love each other. Listen, what, what he's talking about here is this, is this, <laughs> I had a Beatles moment. What, what, this, what this is, is come together right now. It's what the, the, this thing comes together, this body comes together in such a way that not only is it a witness to the world, but also, ladies and gentlemen, unity is maintained in the body of Christ. And what we need, what, 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 this, what this body needs, what every uh, Christ body needs, what every Christ marriage needs, what every Christ marriage needs is, is a love cover-up. We need a love cover-up, folks. Because I am imperfect and so are you. And instead of getting mad and saying, well, phew, I'm never going back there again. What we ought to say is, you know, they're just being stupid. <laughs> He's just being stupid, but I still love Pastor Clay. That, that's really what it is. Well, one of my favorite, I've told this before. <laughs> one of my favorite, by the way, I, I won't be senile until I forget that I've told you these stories before. But I've told this before, but one of my favorite stories uh, is a story of, uh, of Dewberry Baptist Church. Uh, it, some of y'all remember the story, but uh, the Dewberry Baptist Church churches uh, lie at either end of the road where my father-in-law lives. And at one time, there was, just, there was Dewberry Baptist Church, and Dewberry Baptist Church 
uh, one time was holding a fundraiser. They were selling chicken dinners. By the way, that's another reason not to have fundraisers, but I won't go there. Um, but they were having a fundraiser, and they were selling chicken dinners, and, uh, and two guys got in a fight over the chicken dinners. Now, I don't, I don't know if anybody even still knows what, what it was, but one wanted this sauce, or one wanted another sauce, or one wanted to charge this price, and one wanted to charge that price, or, or one thought it should only be legs and thighs. and what, I, don't, I don't know, whatever all it was. But they got in a fight about this. And before long, I mean, they wouldn't let it go. And before long, the whole church took up sides, you know, on, on, on which, which side of the chicken dinner they stood. And it, and it became so traumatic in, in, in the body that is Dewberry Baptist Church that they, they split over the great chicken dinner controversy. And neither one of them wanted to give up the name. Hence, Dewberry Baptist Church number one on the... Uh, would be, I guess, the south side of the road or east side of the road, and Dewberry Baptist Church number two at the other end of the church, at the other end of the road. Both of them a monument to the love of God within the body of Christ. Not. Now, listen, let me say this. I know I, what time is it? Oh, I, gotta, I gotta need to go on, but let me say this. If you came to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior here at Cross Culture Church, and this is the only church experience you have ever known, bless you. You have no idea how blessed you are. You, 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 you have no idea how blessed you are. Because in. And so you, you, you've never, if that's, if that's the case for you, you've never experienced the, the backbiting and the gossiping and the snipping and the power struggles and, the, and, and the, all the stuff that, that goes on a lot at a lot of churches. It is incredibly unbiblical, insanely dysfunctional, but it happens all the time in churches all over America. And Peter says, man, you got you to love. You got to love each other. Now think of the implications of that for the body here. Think, think, think of what that means for us and how to know. Man, it's good to know. And, and, I, and I feel like, that I know we have this to some degree and it's always stuff we can work on, but, but think of it to, to know. For, for Fred to know that I have his back. And for me to know that Fred has my back. For Coral to know that, that she can... She can trust in what Rocky's going to uh, do for her. And Rocky can trust. You understand what I'm saying? When, when we know, when we know that we've got each other, that's love. And that is a tremendous, tremendous witness to the world. And it's unity to the body. And so as a result of the unity of the body, God is glorified through it. Got it? Ah, so much more I could say about that. But... I must get to the third idea today before I let you get out of here. And in some sense, I know I'm going to be preaching to the choir with this one, as the old saying goes. But here's the third idea this morning. We are called to a life of service. Verse 10 and 11, watch. He says, uh, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So see where the love goes? This is, this is what ends up, this is a natural byproduct of it. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever, in other words, a, a, a teacher, a, a preacher, whatever the case, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things, watch this, so that in all things, would you say that next line with me? God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We are called to a life of service. And, and can you see how vitally intricately connected this life of death and this life of love are to this idea of life of service? Because the truth is, if, if, if I don't make up my mind that, that I'm, that I'm going to live my life as a, as a dead man to myself, if I don't make that mind up first, and if I don't love people unconditionally and, and overlooking their faults, covering over their faults with, with the love that God gives me for them, if I don't do that, you know what I won't do? I'll never serve the body of Christ. Because what have they done for me lately? 
Or how, do, how does this benefit me? Or how can I get out of that? Or, or whatever else we, we could think of. We are called to a life of service. Bottom line. Period. Exclamation point. No way out of it. No wiggle room. No anything. This is just the calling on our life. Notice that first part of verse uh, 10, Peter says, as each one has received. As each one has received. Uh, should I say it a third time? <laughs> as each one has received. In other words, every single one of us who claim the name of Christ. Now you may be here and you haven't made a decision yet for Christ. So technically this doesn't apply to you yet. I would get in the boat with Jesus, but that then this will apply to it, but that's another thing. Every single person who claims the name of Jesus Christ as each one has received. You have been equipped. We're going to talk about that in a second. But it, it, there's, there's nobody left out. Everybody is a part. Of, everybody has to be a part of this. And uh, Peter uh, uses the term as received. Uh, New American Standard translates it a, a special gift. A special is in italics, meaning it's not in the original language. It's given there for clarification. But as each one has received a special gift, uh, Charisma in, in the Greek. Uh, obviously the, the root word uh, charis, grace. So it, it is in essence a, a grace gift. Probably a reference to spiritual gifts. That the Bible says every single person who has received Christ their Savior has received at least one of. Possibly more. But at least, if you're here and you've trusted Christ, your Savior, the Bible says that, that you have received at least one special or grace gift. It, it, and there's a, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different places in Corinthians and Romans, and we can talk about all that stuff. But, but it, it, it's that, the idea that everyone has received this, this grace gift. You, by the way, you don't, you don't decide what gifts you're going to receive. They are given to you at, at salvation, when you trust Christ as your Savior, God gives them to you, and He gives them to you for the benefit of the body. For the benefit of the body. That's why they give it, He gives it to you. And so, then Peter goes on, and he says, he says, employ it. He says, employ it. Now, you're never going to believe. Y'all are never going to believe what that means in the Greek. It means put it to work. It means use it. It means use what you have given this, this charisma, this, this grace gift to employ it for the body, for the good of the body and for the glory of God. There it is right there. That's, that's the whole reason we serve, for the good of the body and the glory of God. But what about me? Yeah, you dead. Who are you talking to? <laughs> That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the call. That's the call. To employ it, to put it to work, to use it for, for this good, for this, for this good of this body and for the glory of God. That's why we're given gifts, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, uh, how should I put this? I've heard just about every excuse you can imagine uh, for not, people not serving. I've had people tell me they, they couldn't serve because, um, because they're just uh, they're too busy. I've had people tell me they couldn't serve because they, they're, they're too tired by the end of the week working at their, at their job. I've had people tell me they couldn't serve because they were too old. I've had people tell me they couldn't serve because they were too young. I, I've had people tell me they couldn't serve because they didn't feel uh, qualified or, or equipped uh, to do something. I've had people tell me just about every reason you can possibly imagine, and, and anybody that's ever been in a position of leadership that's gone recruiting people to serve can, can amen what I'm saying here. Even though you didn't, you could. Thank you. Thank you. Could, uh, you, you could, can identify with this, and can I tell you? Listen, I'm just being brutally honest. We just have to take it. We just have to take the excuses that people give. 
Because after all, this is a volunteer army. Right? But I'm going on record. I know I'm preaching to the choir. But I'm going on record as saying, God absolutely does not have to accept our excuses. And will not accept our excuses. For not serving within the body of Christ. For not utilizing the gifts. By the way, it is charisma. It is grace gift. And he's probably referring to spiritual gifts. But it would be just as applicable to just to say to, to everything that you have. Because, by the way, everything that you have is by the grace of God. Whether it's a natural talent, whether it's an ability, whether it's a skill that you've acquired, whether it's this, whether it's that, whether it's your financial resources, ultimately it all is a grace gift from God. And Peter says, employ it, put it to work for the good of the body and the glory of God, put it to work. If you are part of, have been attending this church or part of this church and you have not found a place of, of service in the body of Christ, I want you to understand this. It is not because we do not have dozens and dozens of places for you to serve within the body. I, uh, I, I just jotted down a few that came to my mind. The thing that the things that just uh, just things, and I'm sure I, I I'm telling you there are just dozens of places. So somebody's going to say, "Oh, you forgot this, you forgot that." But anyway, look, can I just get listen? We need life group leaders. We need life group host homes. We need people to minister to to children and to to teenagers. We need greeters. That's our frontline ministry. We need to put people to set it up and tear it all down. That ministry is okay. We need to someone, someone to manage the maintenance of our trucks. Because can I tell you who it's on now? Yeah. And if you ask my wife what kind of mechanic I am. We need praise team members. We need cafe ministers. We need people to come in here and, and set up. Unique, bless her heart. Either she does it or, or my wife does it or, or somebody else. I mean, to set that up. I mean, you come in, you have a cup of coffee. Good on you, mate. But somebody did that. We need artists and set designers and carpenters. We need website savvy people. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> as I said. We need soundboard technicians and lighting technicians and camera technicians. By the way, you do know what a technician is, right? A technician is simply somebody who is willing to try and willing to be trained. That's a technician. That's all. Was that all in my head, Tyler? <laughs> I think it was it. I just, just a few came to mind. I just, so I know, listen, I'm just, I'm just saying there, there is no reason, there's no excuse that God will accept for the body not ministering to the body. This is called, and listen, it's not, it's not age qualified. Every child of God, literally a child or a teenager or an adult should be ministering to this body in some way and somehow. I'm just, I'm just being as honest as I can. I'm just laying it out there. For your good and God's glory. That's why it is. So the gifts, talents, resources, all those things that are given to you are given for the body's good and God's glory. Now, real quickly, I've got to close out, I know, but I want to give it to you. If, you, if any of you have read uh, Rick Warren's uh, book, Purpose Driven Life, maybe you'll remember this acrostic shape. You Anybody remember the acrostic shape that talks about uh, our, our, how, we're, how we're part of this body. The S stands for spiritual gifts. I mentioned it earlier. It, it, it are, it, they are those uh, spiritual attributes that God gives to us when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it could, could be the, the gift of teaching or hospitality or, or mercy. or It's a lot of different things, but it's, it's, a, it's an, a supernatural enhancement or gift that God gives to the to the body listen we're, I hope we're going to be able to do some things in 2016 to help you understand and discover more about your spiritual gifts but but you have them if you know Christ as your savior you have at least one more than likely more than one and God give them, gave them to you for a purpose okay I know I gotta hurry uh, H is for heart what, man, what, what gets your motor running? What, what are you passionate about? Well, I, I like doing this, right? I think that. Or how can you use that 
to minister to the body of Christ. That, 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 that's where, we're, or where Warren is going with this, this idea that, that you know, because what, what you have heart, what you're passionate about is an area that, that you're going to be interested in and it's possibly an area that God is, is directing you to be involved in. Uh, a is for abilities. Not only the spiritual gifts, but just the abilities that you have. Uh, some of you can probably play an instrument. What are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, I'm just saying. Maybe, maybe you really don't play an instrument, but you're like me, you like to think you do, and so we really may not want to hear it. But if you, if you can play an instrument, or if you can sing, or if you can, you know, what are the abilities that you have? What are the skill sets you have? Are you good with your hands? Are you, are you, are you good talking? Are you, uh, you know, what, what are the abilities that you have? Those, 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 are, those are gifts, ultimately, from God. Uh, P is personality. What, what, who, who are you? What is your personality like? Is your personality such that you would make a great greeter for Cross Culture Church? <laughs> Deborah, Deborah Martin laughed. So, so what, what is maybe your personality? Listen, your personality may not make you a good greeter at Cross Culture Church. I've known some people, I'm like, no, do not put them on the greeter team. Because they're, right? Cause you, you don't, you know, again, the old church, y'all ever walked into church, you know, where some. Well, Clay, hush, go on, I'll go on. But, okay, but what's your personality? Is your personality such that you, you just love getting down there and messing around with children and, and, and playing with them and, you know, all that kind of stuff? Is your personality such that, that you like to teach or, you know, what, what, what's your personality? That, that really is part, uh, I think, of, of who you are. And then the E is experience. What are the experiences that you have? More than likely, most of them would be job-related. You've gained experience doing this or, or doing that. I, I'm always fascinated to hear people's, uh, because it, sometimes it just blows me away when people say, oh yeah, I know how to do such and such. I'm like, what? You know how to deactivate a nuclear device? <laughs> we could use you here. <laughs> what is the experience that you have in life? And how do, how do those, you know, they're not just there. Listen, and listen. They could even be a tragedy. That's an experience. But it is even those tragedies that God can use you to minister to the body. To the body. And I'm telling you, when we do that, and, and I'll say it one more time, I'm preaching to the choir. I don't say this enough. I, I know I've got to close out, but I want to say this to you. We have people who faithfully fulfill this. Week after week after week. As a matter of fact, some of you take on two and three and, and, and four different ministries and serve in different areas. God bless you. Thank you. I wish you didn't have to, quite honestly. I wish there were so many people lining up to serve that we'd have to, we'd have to, no, oh, I'm sorry, you, you can't serve over there. We've got too many people over there. <laughs> Be awesome. So I don't say it enough. Thank you. Thank you for serving the body of Christ that is Cross Culture Church. If we are going to be all that I believe God wants us to be, if we're going to achieve what I believe is the vision of this church from the very beginning to reach thousands of people, thousands of people in, in, the, in the greater Raleigh area and central North Carolina and even to the ends of the earth, if we are going to do that, ladies and gentlemen, we have to, to have all hands on deck. We have to serve. We have to go. We have to give. We have to do. And you'll get tired. And you'll be underappreciated. Feel like you're underappreciated. And you'll feel at times like somebody else is not pulling their weight. Maybe they're not. But. I'm called to a life of death. I'm called to a life of love. And I'm called to a life of service. And if I put those three together, listen to me. If I put those three together, that's better than anything any Powerball could ever give you. Because it will give you ultimately what God says you were created for. It will give you meaning and purpose and contentment in a relationship with Him. 
where you serve the body of Christ to the glory of God. I, I think this is the eighth year. I was looking when I pre- set up my preaching calendar for 2016. This, I'm starting my eighth year of, of my preaching calendar for Cross Culture Church. The vision that I believe God laid on my heart years ago and others' heart is still the vision that can be accomplished at this church. We can rock the world. We can change people's eternal destinies. We really can. But we need people. Listen, uh, he, he's not here today, so I'll go ahead and say this. Um, I, had, I had lunch. I, I would have said it anyway if he's here. I had lunch uh, a, while, a little while back with Sebastian. Sebastian and his family uh, have been attending Cross Culture for a few months. And uh, when I had lunch with Sebastian, he said something that really blessed me. It really encouraged me. And here's what he said. He said, we see Cross Culture. And, and they came from a very large church. They, they, geographically, they couldn't longer attend there. They came from a very large church. And he said, we see Cross Culture as a small church with big ideas. And he said, and we're, we don't see that as a negative, the fact that Cross Culture, that all these seats aren't full. He said, we didn't see that as a negative. We saw it as a positive. We saw it as an opportunity to come in and be a part of building something from the ground up to the glory of God and seeing what all God would do about it. He said, he said we, we saw it as, as something exciting and a great opportunity. It just blessed me as a pastor because sometimes I forget after eight years I, I forget the grind and 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 why are there still empty seats and and why did these people decide to leave and why are these people unhappy about this or that or or whatever else and listen what we need we need people like that we need people that 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 don't care about who's unhappy with this or don't care about that if we don't have that or we don't have this but who believe in who and who and what we can be to the glory of God and to the good of the body A call to die, a call to love, a call to serve. As Pastor Clay pointed out in today's message, those three callings are intricately tied together. Unless you're willing to die to yourself, you probably won't love people when they don't deserve to be loved. And without a deep love for the body of Christ, you'll probably struggle serving. The difference for us is the power of God working in us that enables us to do what our sinful nature doesn't want to do. With the Spirit of God working in us, we become the kind of person that dies to their fleshly desires, forgives others' faults, and faithfully serves the body of Christ. We hope you'll come join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather every week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, safe, and fun kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.